This man shaves his eyebrows every day. Then he puts on a wig and dress up like a woman. First he makes breakfast. Then he does the housework until 8.15 in the morning. Then he changed back into his man's clothes. After preparing meals, he would leave a note for himself or more precisely, for his other self. Yes, the secret of this man was that he had a dual personality, raised under the oppressive influence of his mother. No one knew what she had done to him, but as he grew up, his psyche manifested another soul. One long past, Emma, a symbol of motherhood. They shared one body, but not their memories. Each morning, Emma would briefly take over, completing all the household duties. By 8.15 a.m., he would revert back to John, as long as no one witnessed the transformation, John managed external affairs. Emma the internal. In the evening, John would shop for groceries following the notes Emma left, even hiding his personal savings from his alter ego. This strange but peaceful coexistence was shattered by a tragic accident, a train derailment that sent a carriage crashing into their yard, miraculously unharmed. He was discovered by his neighbors, but as Emma, though she quickly retreated and switched back to John, the town was already abuzz with rumors of a woman in John's house. The incident not only disrupted his stable life, but also the order within his inner world. For the first time, breakfast was uncharacteristically sloppy, and the note for John was curt. Go to work, and don't talk to anyone. John felt a sense of injustice, helpless in controlling the situation. The train accident and the mysterious woman at John's house became the talk of the town. Even the mayor, who normally wouldn't have reason to speak with him, visited John's office to express concern, thrusting John from the fringes directly into the spotlight, a change he was utterly unprepared for. Under the guidance of the town sheriff, John dialed the railway company, arranging for them to remove the derailed train from his backyard by Friday. However, that very day, as Emma fetched the newspaper, the arrival of two unexpected guests threw another stone into the already turbulent waters of their lives. One was an advisor to the incumbent senator, and the other was the wife of Peacock City's mayor. They were there because of the train in the backyard. It turned out that in the midst of the senatorial elections, the incumbent senator's opponent was using the derailed train as a symbol of the senator's faltering political career, attempting to tarnish his reputation determined not to let the opponent succeed. The advisor had come to ask if they could use John's backyard to host an event that would integrate the train into a rally for the senator, aiming to turn defeat into victory. After hearing their proposal, Emma hesitated. She pushed aside the curtains, looked at the neighboring children playing joyfully, and made a decision. Thus, at 8.15 that day, John was not called back. Emma disrupted the balance she had with John, trading it for more social interaction. She no longer feared the outdoors. Instead, developing a keen interest in the new world outside, her interest grew especially strong when she learned about the women's shelter run by the mayor's wife, renowned for its child adoption assistance. Emma and the mayor's wife quickly became friends, unquestionably due to Emma's initiatives. John's life became chaotic, not to mention being late for work. But the idea of hosting a gathering in his backyard was unbearable for him. When he found out Emma had agreed to it, John was furious, losing his temper in front of all the gathered officials, which even led to a scolding from the mayor himself. John wasn't opposed to the rally per se, but he was against the disruption of his peaceful life and the growth of Emma's personality. He knew who Emma was and couldn't let her take control. However, one problem followed another, leaving him reeling. That evening, another unexpected visitor arrived, John's ex-girlfriend, Maggie. In an attempt to escape poverty, she had decided to take her child and move to another city to stay with family members. She came to John for travel money, and it was then that John discovered he had a child. Unbeknownst to him, his mother had secretly been sending Maggie checks to keep her away from John. After his mother's death, and after Maggie struggled working two jobs for a year, she could no longer bear it and decided to seek John out. The sudden revelation of having a son left John with mixed emotions. He asked Maggie to wait while he went upstairs to clear his head. However, when he came down, it was Emma who descended the stairs, not John. Maggie was startled upon seeing another person in the house and, after exchanging a few words with Emma, hurriedly left with her child. Maggie's adorable child had made a deep impression on Emma, and she could no longer contain her longing. For the first time, Emma completely left the house, driving Maggie and the child home. 
This outing was immensely rewarding for Emma, not only enhancing her social skills, but also learning to drive with Maggie's assistance. While at Maggie's house, Emma learned crucial information. Maggie's desire to leave, the checks from John's mother, and the gradually revealed past between Maggie and John. As mentioned before, Maggie was very poor, driven to the point where she resorted to prostitution years ago. John's mother had paid Maggie to make a man out of John. But upon arrival, Maggie realized the extent of the mother's controlling nature. She not only forced John and Maggie into a relationship, but also watched the entire process. A twisted act that undeniably traumatized Maggie and resulted in a child. Emma! Now understanding more about John and his mother, became curious about the room that had been John's mother's, a place no one had ever entered. Inside, she found old photographs, clothes, and even a camera that resonated with her. Lying on John's mother's bed, she felt a deep connection in their almost insane love for children, intensifying her own longing for a child, driven by the desire to have a child of her own. Emma considered adopting Maggie's child. She learned that if the child resided in the women's shelter run by the mayor's wife, the adoption process would be more efficient. Needing this advantage, Emma once again agreed to host the rally involving the train in her backyard to curry favor with the mayor's wife. She then convinced Maggie to move into the shelter. After everything was settled and Emma returned home, she accidentally found the key to John's safe. It seemed everything was aligning perfectly under Emma's direction, with John absent throughout the day, only to be awakened in the evening by the mayor's wife coming to express her gratitude. John was furious, as Emma had completely broken their rules. She had used up the entire day that should have belonged to John, disposing of the cold breakfast and unwrapping a gift from the mayor's wife. John spiraled into a meltdown, bewildered by Emma's actions. However, the next morning seemed as if everything had returned to normal. The gift was gone, and meals were prepared. With even the broken dishes cleaned up, it appeared Emma had pulled back. Yet, looking into the yard, and seeing the stages already being set up, John realized what Emma had done. No wonder the mayor's wife had come back to thank him. Outraged, John immediately halted the ongoing work and decided it was time to stop Emma's growth. In a determined effort to permanently address the issue, John hired a local mechanic, paying a significant sum to have the derailed train removed from his backyard. However, he hadn't anticipated that Emma's involvement extended beyond just organizing the rally. At the bank, John received a call from Maggie, learning for the first time that Emma had met with Maggie and was gradually getting closer to the child. This was unacceptable to him. John left work again and rushed home, intending to drive to Maggie, only to discover that the car had been used by Emma. Even more unsettling, Emma had opened his mother's room, and a photo of Emma that had once appeared in the newspapers was now framed and placed by the bed. Everything signaled that Emma was moving from the background to the forefront. Upon meeting Maggie, John immediately offered to pay her travel expenses to ensure her and her son's departure, arguing that it wasn't safe for the child to stay. After Maggie left the shelter, John realized he could no longer allow himself to revert to Emma. He decided to give all his savings to Maggie and to leave home permanently with her, wherever she wanted to go. When Maggie expressed concern about not wanting to cause trouble between him and his spouse, John finally admitted that Emma was not his wife. To John, this admission was a full confession. While Maggie might have interpreted it simply as a husband venting about marital strife, Returning from seeing Maggie, John intended to withdraw money and leave immediately with her, but the bank was closed. Unable to go home for fear of becoming Emma again, John decided to spend the night outside. That's when he encountered the sheriff, one of the friendliest people in town. In a rare moment of vulnerability, John confided his true feelings, which the sheriff misinterpreted as missing his mother. Despite John's protests, the sheriff insisted on taking him back home. After the sheriff left, John quickly grabbed his luggage and fled to a motel, planning to wait there until the bank opened. But when he thought everything was settled and opened his luggage, he realized that he had never truly escaped Emma's influence. Emma! Driven by a relentless desire to have a child, began systematically removing any obstacles in her path. She first dismissed the mechanic tasked with dismantling the train, maintaining the symbolic wreck in her backyard. Then, she approached Maggie, using the guise of John's persona to lure her back to the shelter, 
promising a bank job as bait. Unexpectedly, Maggie refused, bolstered by John's support and determined to leave Peacock City. In a bold move, Emma broke the boundaries of their dual personalities, no longer softly spoken, but adopting John's masculine voice outright. Over the phone, using John's voice, she arranged to meet Maggie at a motel. Later, she dressed in John's clothes, withdrew his savings from the bank, and loaded John's bicycle into the car's trunk, erasing every trace of John's male identity, including shaving off his eyebrows. That evening, dressed elegantly, Emma seduced a worldly man at a bar and brought him to the motel where she had arranged to meet Maggie. In a dark turn, she killed him when he was off guard and used John's clothes and prepared gasoline to set the scene for a fire. When Maggie arrived, the fire was raging uncontrollably. The man's body burned beyond recognition. The next day, the sheriff announced John's death. Deemed an accident, the community mourned the unfortunate event. But as John had been a reclusive figure, his memory quickly faded. Not long after, the train rally proceeded in his backyard, with the citizens of Poolcock City gathering to support the senator. Everyone achieved their desires, including Emma, who temporarily gained custody of the child. In a moment meant to capture joy, Emma's attempt to photograph the child triggered painful memories, revealing to her the weight of John's past sufferings. She realized what John had been carrying all along and understood why he had tried to stop her. Recognizing her controlling nature might create another tormented soul like John. Emma decided to make the same choice John had, giving all the money to Maggie and urging her to take the child and leave. Watching Maggie and the child walk away was heart-wrenching for Emma, but she knew it was necessary. She closed all the curtains and doors, resuming her secluded life behind the window. Watching the world go by, the outside world was intriguing. But for Emma, staying inside was the safest choice. Thus ends her tale, a story of conflict, identity, and ultimately, the recognition of one's limits and the sacrifices made for others' well-being.